Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I have been a loyal listener to his podcast for over a decade. I do not miss an episode, even when it's Richard Duncan and he's talking about creditism. <laughs> He is the CEO of McIlvaney Financial and the McIlvaney Group of Companies. He also hosts the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary for over a decade. Once a week, it is phenomenal, phenomenal content for free. He wrote a book in the last couple of years. It is a self-help book about overcoming the trials and tribulations in life called Intentional Legacy. It's available on audiobook. I read it. It's really good. And he also recently in the last couple of years, his company has the Vaulted app which is something that a lot of gold money customers that are not really too happy with how the prices have gone up at gold money, how they can now save in precious metals using an app. Uh, They can buy precious metals easily using an app. David McIlvaney, thank you for joining me again. Hey, Jason. Great to be with you again. I always enjoy being on your program. So, David, it's been unbelievably crazy (laughs) the last four and a half months. (laughs) Let me just list some of the things that I thought I would never see. So we've had negative oil prices. We've had initial bankruptcy offerings. We've had kids day trading ages 10 to teenager that are out trading hedge fund managers, outperforming hedge fund managers, and angry Goldman Sachs customers that are demanding why are these kids out trading them. We have Davy Day Trader Global, who has an enormous following now and is building a I guess, a trading brand. I want you to comment on the craziness of the last four and a half months and if you think things can get worse from where they are right now. You know, Jason, I think a lot of things tie to how much money is sloshing around in the system and the kinds of um, craziness that you're describing um, does tie to sort of an, an, an unbound amount of money uh, and credit in the system. So, you know, is anyone caring much about risk uh, in a context where you've got the central banks of the world willing to backstop any trade? You know, you look at junk bonds and you're like, well, it's a sure bet. It has to be a sure bet because we know that the Fed is going to buy as much as they need to, either through ETFs or through uh, maybe even they allow uh, direct purchases of those kinds of bonds. So far, they haven't stretched to the high yield or junk status, uh, junk, junk category, um, but nothing is off the table. So in an environment where nothing is off the table, the market becomes a one-way bet, and all of a sudden the minds of Goldman Sachs or hedge fund traders looking at either macro trends or doing bottom-up fundamental analysis, none of it matters. None of it matters, and I think one of the things that's going to be the big lesson um, is it two months from now, two days from now, two years from now, the big lesson will be that, yep, fundamentals do matter. You do have to do your research. You do have to do your homework. And to the degree that you um, ignore some of the things that have made for some of the great trading successes, it, it's not a matter of luck. Um, but that's going to be one of the, the great lessons as people nurse losses um, in, in the weeks, in months and years ahead. Uh, they'll look back and say, ooh, Wow, I, I, I guess I guess it was just dumb luck. I don't think there's very many bond vigilantes left. Um, the bond traders that I've heard talk about just talk about how easy money it is to just front run the Fed or front run the ECB now on either zombie corporate debt or government bonds. Yeah, you know, the way I've looked at bond vigilantes over the last five uh, to 10 years is, and, and this was something that we talked about on the podcast, which you mentioned, we, we're now in our 13th year of doing that. It's been quite an exercise. And, you know, one of the things that we've brought out in, in that podcast is you know, the bond vigilantes are, are, are in a very awkward position. It, you know, you've got the bold moves of the Federal Reserve. That playbook has been exported to People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, ECB and the the you know sort of do anything to save the system puts the bond vigilantes in a very awkward position and I, I've I've postulated that the gold market is probably where you'd see the bond vigilantes show up where they can they can still cast a protest vote um, but maybe it's not what you would expect in the fixed income markets it's just a system opt out if the system is broken. And you don't know what the implications of a broken system or a system where prices are controlled as as we see. And and there's even more discussion now of the Federal Reserve controlling the yield curve, which is just another fancy way of saying we're going to set prices. Um, The bond vigilante, what what do you do in in, in the context of um, fixed pricing? I, I think you do see, and that's where we have already 
you know, 2005 to the present, a gradual migration of investors into the gold market. And we've got gold setting new highs, new all-time highs in a dozen different currencies in the last six months. So the traffic's there. Um, the bond vigilantes aren't dead. And, and I do think that there will come a day when they can pounce. And, you know, two weeks ago on the weekly commentary, we talked about the exchange rate mechanism going back to the early 90s, where, you know, you set a band and thought you could control the outcomes in terms of the way European currencies traded next to each other. Soros came along and said, yeah, we'll, we'll see how much firepower you're willing to commit to this band. Uh, you want to maintain control? You want to maintain prices? I I'm going to push you to the limit. He did. He pushed him to the limit and he broke the band. The exchange rate mechanism disappeared. Um, he made a billion dollars in the process. And, you know, between Druckenmiller and, and, and Soros, they've, they've had quite some trading success. But th that I do think you'll see, Jason, in, in the bond markets eventually. Um, it's a little bit different this time, just because you've got the concerted efforts of the world's central banks. At the end of the day, you still have the public that gets to vote. And I'm not sure they can avoid a super inflation um, if, if they want to control the prices in the bond market. You're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And if they want to take control, fine. If they want to place all the private owners of bonds, fine. Um, but I think you're going to see the consequence of that in the currency markets, uh, which again is where I think gold is is a decent tell. Smart investors are saying, yeah, I think I know how this is gonna end. I might as well take a position now. We're recording this interview on Friday, June 26th. The gold price is at $1,771. Silver is a little bit of below 18 at $17.78. It's had a nice little rally, silver has. Gold has been capped for a while. You brought up Stanley Druckenmiller though, and I think the bond vigilantes, David, I think they're more worried, or well, not more worried, I think they're being more aggressive attacking emerging markets for now because the emerging markets can do all the central bank games that the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the People's Bank of China, and the Federal Reserve can do. So the emerging market currencies are the ones that have come under the most pressure the last four or five months, but bringing up Stanley Druckenmiller, it's really interesting because he did an interview on CNBC and then they bashed him for hours after that, where he apologized that he didn't see the stock market rally, but he was looking at the fundamentals and then all these central banks, like you said, it was coordinated, it was concerted, about at least $20 trillion in commitments from all these different central banks, from government fiscal stimulus injections. So that currency, I've been stressing this to my podcast listeners, people aren't going to put it under their mattress. It's going to be spent on something. And it appears that things are getting, I guess, frothy in the stock market. A lot of people who got those $1,200 stimulus checks who didn't necessarily need them to pay bills, it sounds like a lot of it got put into the stock market on gambling. When I think of Stanley's views on things, I, I think yeah, it depends on what time frame he, he has in mind. He's He's been interested in gold. He's been interested in um, you know taking some risk out of the equation. And then you do get an interview like that where he says, well, I should have had more risk on the table. Is he talking about this week's trades? Is he talking about a huge percentage of his net worth? Um, you know, I think anyone can regret not having been more active in a short time frame. And so are, is, he, is he talking about, again, short term or intermediate or long term? Um, that there is reason on an intermediate and long term basis to be cautious. And there is reason in the short run to find uh, some trades which are speculative in nature, but profitable in nature. And so does he regret not playing those short-term speculative trades a little bit more aggressively? That's the nature of a trader. That's who he is. Um, but I think if you look at the lion's share of his positioning, it's, it's still moving more defensive and rightfully so. Yeah, one of his top trading rules where he's made a lot of money with leveraged currency bets and leveraged bond trades is following the liquidity flows of central banks. And I guess maybe he didn't follow his own rule too much this time because he was talking about the fundamentals of the real economy, which are obviously horrible. I haven't really seen any improvement in the real economy yet. I don't believe the retail sales numbers that I think they were an anomaly in the last couple of weeks because I think a lot of people on unemployment are getting paid, what, $600 more a week and then the stimulus checks. But the real economy has a cash flow problem. Are you worried in the coming, maybe? 12 months, maybe even less than that, about the cash flow problem uh, uh, materializing with corporate bonds and commercial real estate and residential real estate? Yeah, I mean, we are talking about two different universes where the central banks can create liquidity and, and funnel it into the financial markets. 
And so you do see a, a healthy pop in asset prices and it, it, it stimulates uh, your speculators to, to kind of go hog wild. Uh, is, is there a scarcity of activity in the real economy? Yeah, the answer is yes. And, and, and that's where we don't know with, with things like COVID still representing uh, something of an unknown variable coming into the fall. Um, uh, wh- what kind of dampening effect does that have on economic activity? Everyone's been hopeful that we'll kind of get through the worst of it. The summer months will kind of see the, uh, the, the, the problem die out and, you know, and then we'll be back to normal and, and should, should even finish the year um, on a really strong uh, GDP growth note. I just don't, I don't, I don't see that yet. I don't, I, there's no evidence yet that we are making up for lost ground, economically speaking. So you've got the tale of, of two universes, like Dickens' tale of two cities. Um, one is the financial markets uh, with a direct feed of stimulus from the central banks. And the other is the economy where there's a reason to be concerned. And, and, and ultimately the financial markets need to reflect the, the underlying fundamentals. And this kind of disconnect here is, is I think one of the things that I would mark as fairly unhealthy. We have Microsoft and Apple closing their physical stores or bricks and mortar retail stores. Not all of them. I think uh, Apple's not closing all of them, but Microsoft, I think, just announced today they're going to close, I think, all of them in malls. They're switching to online software. You Almost every day, there's a big name company that most of our listeners on Main Street are familiar with that's declaring bankruptcy. Are you worried that the banks are going to be the large U.S. banks, which the Fed is claiming for months now that the banks are in good shape? Are you worried that the real estate problems coming down here in the near future? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. banks are going to have some problems. They've had forbearance um, in motion, which a lot of the, the the sort of leniency they've had with folks that couldn't make payments um, you know, is 90 days. And so here we are coming towards the, the end of July uh, and as we get into the early August timeframe, I think you're going to see U.S. banks kind of scrambling. And um, so there'll be a little bit more pressure there. Um, coming into this crisis, U.S. banks are in pretty good position. Um, and, and, you know, th- there's we don't have the exact kinds of leverage in the banking system that we had uh, coming into 2008 and 2009. European banks are, are arguably a little bit more exposed. And so to the degree that we see continued pressure in terms of global activity uh, and, 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 and emerging pressure in, in the financial system globally, um, European banks are probably in a worse position than we are. Does that mean we default? Uh, are, the, are the winners? Um, maybe. But, you know, would I be going out and buying financials right now? I don't, I don't think so. Do you think the rules are going to change then so there's not bankruptcies and defaults then for commercial real estate and people paying their mortgages? Because like you said, there's been forbearance, but how long can they get away with that? Because there's mortgage back, sec- there's residential mortgage backed securities, and then there's commercial real estate mortgage backed securities too that need the cash flow coming in from people actually paying rent. Right. So I think the most vulnerable parts are if you're just not big enough to matter. So your your small to medium sized businesses. I mean, I think one of the big transitions we're going through is uh, where the big get bigger and the small simply go away. Um, it, it's a story of of further eliminating the middle class. The middle class is tied to small and and, and medium sized businesses, and these are the guys that aren't big enough individually to matter, and they don't have any sort of collective unifying bargaining power. So, as the money flows, as the bailout dollars go out, whether it's the treasury or the Fed, um, you are talking about. Uh, the guys in the middle, uh, your entrepreneurs who your mom and pop shops everywhere. And, and that would include if you're talking about banks, you know, your small regional banks, uh, small city banks and, and, and whatnot. <laughs> They're just not, in, they can't get in line. They can't get in line. They're not big enough to be saved. So those assets are going to get gobbled up. And most likely we see special purpose vehicles launched again, like we had Maiden Lane, Maiden Lane, all the variations of that back in 2008 and 2009, where you could just sweep a bunch of assets in or do asset swaps. And, you know, the Federal Reserve basically allows their balance sheet to swell and they're willing to make sure that financial institutions say plenty liquid and, 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 and that we don't get off the rails. I think the smart investor is going to be the person who says, all right, so they're able to 
keep things off the boil and we're, nobody's melting down emotionally, nobody's panicking. Um, th- does this ultimately come at a cost? And I, I again come back to this idea of um, it'll show up in the currency. You can do anything you want, Jason, it, it, but but everything you do in life comes at a cost. You you know, energy that you spend, um, what you put in motion. Uh, you know, if you create a business or, 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 or you, you commit to X, Y, and Z, you're allocating resources. It comes at a cost, either opportunity cost or just an outright cost. And I, I just don't know how we don't see currency pressures all over the world, all over the world. And some have argued, yeah, but if you see currency pressures everywhere else, isn't the dollar by default still the winner? Yep. That's true. So the problem with currencies measured one against another is that on a relative basis, you may not be able to tell who's winning and who lo- who's losing. And and that's where, again, I'd say currency weakness, you may not be able to gauge on on, on, a, on a, an exchange rate basis that accurately if, if you have multiple currencies declining at the same time, euro, uh, RMB, uh, yen, dollar, all moving down in the same direction, perhaps at the same time. Where are you going to see the weakness show up? Where are you going to have a measurement of, of devaluation? It's, it's, you, you need to look to gold. You need to look to silver. You need to look to real things, hard assets, um, as they are repriced to reflect a loss of purchasing power globally. And you might say, well, the dollar's not crashing. And that's right, because it, it doesn't have to. If, 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 if all currencies measured against each other are under pressure, you're not going to see a lot of weakness. Um, doesn't mean that you're not being impoverished slowly. And so, I, again, I, I think uh, the intelligent investor, it's one of the reasons why we launched Vaulted um, a year and a half ago or so. Very easy way to just say, look, uh, maybe I'm not even interested in gold, but I am interested in positioning in a, a cash equivalence, um, you know, a, a, a banking or savings type account where I can be in, I can be out. Uh, very easily, very ex- inexpensively, kilo bars, Royal Canadian Mint, um, seamlessly uh, with, 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 with healthy pricing. So uh, to me, that is the wave of the future. Any intelligent investor looking to preserve value is going to be positioning one way or another in the metals. And I hope it's sooner than later because um, I, I think there's a lot of turmoil on, on the horizon. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. A lot of the mistakes from the 1920s and 30s are being repeated all over again. So many different so social mistakes, government mistakes, central bank mistakes, a lot of them history. They say history doesn't repeat exactly, but it's definitely rhyming. I'm seeing a lot of the same mistakes repeated from the 20s and 30s. I totally agree. So about the dollar, I think it's complicated what's going on with the dollar. It's been range bound the dollar index for about five years now, back and forth, back and forth. I've called it the dollar tug of war because there's demand for a lot of dollars outside the United States because of all the crazy games. Doug, no- I've interviewed Doug Nolan recently about this too from Credit Bubble Bulletin. He's been a hedge fund manager, as you know, for many, many years tracking credit. The dollar funding markets are where a lot of the shenanigans are played in Europe and Asia, where hedge funds and large banks can then borrow from the dollar funding markets, leverage up a trade, and then go bet on derivatives or currencies or bonds. And the dollar denominated debt they borrowed, now they can't pay it back. So that's one side of the tug of war. And then the other side is you have all the people in power here in DC and at the Federal Reserve who all want to weaken the dollar. But so you have two conflicting. You have demand for dollars outside the United States to pay back those dollar denominated debts and the dollar liabilities. And then you have the people in power here in DC who don't want a strong currency, who want a weaker currency, and they can't get what they want right now. Jason, I think almost anything in life you look at, whether it's family relationships or um, you know business strategy execution or um, as you're describing, the relationships, dollar and you know demand overseas and whatnot, it's complicated. It's complicated. And, and, and so I think many investors want a very clear, clean, easy, neat um, summation of, of an issue, just like we want to do that and kind of simplify and economize other areas of our life too. Come to some hard and, cla- hard and, hard and fast back at black and white conclusions. And it's it's easy to it's easier to navigate life that way, um, but as you're pointing out, it would tend to ignore some nuance, so um, and important details. So I I I think we have to live with the tension of seeing uh, strong dollar demand overseas, 
and seeing also the possibility for uh, devaluations. Um, I brought up the devaluations, not just the slow and steady devaluations of a 2% inflation target or a 3 or 4% inflation target, which they've contemplated raising it up to, uh, the Fed has. Um, but the, the, the clean one-off strokes where, you know, like the British did um, 1931, 1949, 1968, um, where they just lopped off between a third to half the value of, of, of the pound sterling. Those kinds of devaluations, whether it's to relieve the pressure of debt or to gain trade competitiveness, whatever the justification may be, we've seen world reserve currencies do that. And it's not out of the realm of possibility um, that, that that's, that's something we, we resort to. We see the Fed resort to. Um, let's watch the Fed balance sheet. Let's watch the total amount of debt that we have. Let's look at ways in, in which that might um, enable uh, a relief of tension and pressure. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in terms of the devaluation story. Again, I'd say your, your best bet if you're sitting on large dollar deposits is just hedge them. Hedge them. Stay in cash. Great. Fine. Um, but make sure that you've got some sort of a hedge on that cash. And I think gold's proven to be uh, a reasonable uh, hedge over time. Yeah, having some cash in case there's a stock market crash or, or uh, rental properties that go on sale that are good is ideal. But the other part of people's savings, and you've talked about this a lot on your podcast, is for people to have precious metals for their savings. So I don't view gold and silver as an investment. I just view it as um, for savings, insurance, and wealth preservation rather than investment because of how it's taxed here for American citizens. It's a superior denomination. And, and if, you just, if you're looking at what it's been through 5,000 years of history, it's been money first. Okay. And you, okay, so, okay, so you could say commodity first, money second, fine, whatever. It's been treated as money and it's a superior denomination to what can be pre- created in, in, in infinite uh, numbers, uh, fiat currencies today. You, you mentioned Doug Noland. He's on our wealth management team and a great addition to our team. And one of the things we're constantly asking week in and week out is, are we happy with our cash position? And you know, starting last September, we decided to start increasing our cash position. And coming into the February March timeframe, we were already between a forty and fifty percent cash level. And, you, know, I, you might say, "Well, Dave, you're, you're negative cash." Okay, again, this goes back to like the comment we had earlier on Druckenmiller. Well, in what time frame do I think that the ultimate? Uh, demise of the dollar is in play. Yes. But do I think that's happening tomorrow? No. So from a trading standpoint, we want to be out of um, the market to a degree, increase cash positions, make sure that we have an adequate hedge on that, of course. Um, But Doug's a part of our risk management squad, if you will, on the wealth management team, not only managing tactical short for us, um, but also participating in our hard asset portfolios uh, from a risk mitigation standpoint. So phenomenal team. Um, uh, Jason, we're, we're having a blast. I mean, as challenging as these times are, you described the last four and a half months as crazy. You're right. But from an analytical perspective, it's everything that someone who loves uh, the financial markets uh, would want in terms of a challenge, a riddle that changes every day that has to be solved. And to do that with a world-class team, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier professionally. Would you describe the dollar shortage as overblown? Because I think no matter what, David, over the next couple of years, my bills are going to keep going up on everything I need to survive. And unfortunately, I see politicians, I don't see them cutting the size of government meaningfully. I see them wanting to just try to raise taxes on a bunch of different things. So no matter how the real economy is, politicians, they see as a solution, and I'm using air quotes here, they just want to raise taxes. I read about the dollar shortage for the first time. I guess I paid attention to it the first time. Um, maybe 10 years ago, Richard Russell was writing Dow Theory letters and um, great guy. Of course, he was writing in Barron's in, in the 1950s, 56 to 58, in that kind of a time frame. But he described the debt in the world, dollar denominated debt, as a synthetic short on the U.S. dollar. And, and to the degree that we have all this outstanding debt needs to be paid back. It has to be paid back in dollar terms. I, I I get that I get that there is a there is a synthetic short on the dollar and 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 a, a huge amount of demand for uh, dollars I I get that too um, where where we kind of live in in two worlds we still have to look at 
um, people's confidence in the system. And, you know, when you, when you start adding numbers only and look at a, a, a currency system, the debt involved, the potential synthetic short on the dollar, all of these things assume that it just boils down to math. And, and for a long period of time, it can be just math. But then there comes a point where there's confidence that begins to wane. And when confidence wanes, all of a sudden, your money system, your debt system, your credit system is not just about the math. It's about the psychology. And it's about repudiation. It's about a failure of confidence and people trying to exit. And all of a sudden, it's not rational. It's not math. The math doesn't matter at all. Um, if, if people want to get out of a, 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 you know, the, the burning movie theater, so to say, they're not planning. They just run. And, and that's, I think, what people sometimes forget is, is today you've got demand for dollars because of a short sit situation as we've been discussing. Um, but tomorrow you may have that sort of repudiation event where people don't want it. And it's, it's a hot potato, total hot potato. And, and in that case, you see a, a spike in velocity as, as people are just trying to get rid of it as fast as they can. That's not the case we have today, but I think that is something that we can imagine happening and are likely to see on the horizon. Well, I think the dollar shortage is an order of magnitude smaller than the total amount of debt and credit in society. So mathematically, all that debt, and there's way over 250 trillion, and the uh, central banks and governments have just piled on even more in the last four and a half months, making this even crazier, it can't mathematically be paid back. So the problem is total debt, I tell people, in my opinion, not the dollar shortage is a problem, but it's nowhere near as large a problem as the total debt we have at all levels of society throughout the global economy. You know, Jason, one of the things that I, I'm still hearing from investors is, you know, they want to know a price projection on gold and silver, and they want to know price projections on different asset classes. And what you just described is something that is, is totally dysfunctional. You, you can't have, you know, $257 trillion in debt globally and, and have everyone come out a winner. There's going to be winners and losers. And, and there has to be some rational appraisal of risk such that you say, should I be taking as much risk as I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 25 years ago, or is the context of risk beginning to change where I need to think at least a little bit in terms of survival um, of, of getting through a period of time where it's not just about the markets, it's about becoming a political target. And, and, and we forget that public policy is a way of, of, of deciding who wins and who loses. And that is already in motion. It's in, it's in motion because we're experimenting with negative rates. It's, it's in motion because we're experimenting with controlling the yield curve. That these, these are all things that are, that are policy decisions that decide someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. And, and in that case, Jason, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough to say, how am I going to make money today? Just stop it. Stop it. And this is one of the things that bugged me about Druckenmiller's comment the other day. Like he needs to make any more money. Like, like he can somehow regret not having played in the market and, 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 and leveraged up for three weeks. Balderdash. It just doesn't even matter. We're talking about a scenario where the, the implications of dealing with the pressures, $257 trillion in global debt, you, ha you have to be aware that you may be at the receiving end of a policy shift, whether it's tax policy uh, or some other sort of redistribution. Are you prepared for that? I, th I, think, I think that's where all of a sudden you need to have something out of the system. You, 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 you need to be aware that the system uh, and, and all its counterparties, it's not designed to take care of you. Ultimately, where we see this happening over or going over the next three to five years is that people's wealth is going to be extracted from them. And if, if you're not aggressively toning down your lifestyle, um, safeguarding a few dollars here and there, um, you really don't understand what's in play. Because right? this is not just a matter of faith in the priesthood of, of, of central banks. You, you, can't, you can't assume that Powell is infinitely powerful. Is he powerful? Yes. Is monetary policy powerful? Infinitely powerful? No, of course not. You did an excellent interview, I think in 2015 with Carmen Reinhardt. I've recommended that many times because things are starting to play out. There's been so many rules changes in just the last four months, whether that's in the bond market with what the Fed's deciding it's going to buy or shorting 
where it worked, I think, for all of eight weeks. There was shorting opportunities in stocks for maybe eight weeks and then um, and for part of the bond market. And then those rules were changed. The Fed issued press releases. They didn't actually buy anything for two months. So this is what I've been trying to warn people about is in a crisis scenario, the goalposts are going to be constantly moved. You're right. And and this is this is where you know, Carmen's conversation it was a candid conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I love reading her book with Ken Rogoff. This time it's different. Um, I, I thought it was, you know, there's a few people that argue um, statistical um, calculations could have been done differently to improve the quality of the book. I thought it was insightful. I thought it was helpful. Carmen's work since then, um, and she continues to sort of, um, I think she's now chief economist at the IMF or World Bank. I forget which organization, um, but I, I saw some sort of a notice come across the, the screen the other day. Um, her view is that, yeah, public policy is is going to decide winners and losers. Uh, the, the idea of corralling investors, corralling like cattle, like cattle, um, and, and making them go where you want them to go. That's the, that's the nature of financial repression. That's the nature of negative rates. That's the nature of policy choices that have to be made now, otherwise the system implodes. So pragmatically, if you're a policymaker, do you want the system to implode? I mean, we go back to your, your comment earlier about Duncan and creditism. Duncan is deathly afraid of a world where credit dies because he feels that we've become so addicted to it. If the credit systems begin to freeze up, seize up, we're, we're, we're talking about flirting with Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. And, and, and Duncan doesn't like the idea of violence. Maybe he doesn't see himself as a modern day gladiator. And so he doesn't want to go there. And so would rather see the kinds of things that Carmen was describing. Corral investors, extract value, tax the snot out of a certain group. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the reality is policymakers and those who propose certain policies in the spheres of a academia are going to do everything they can to keep us from the world of Mad Max. I, I don't blame them, but I also don't want to be at the end of a nasty public policy whip. Yeah, they want to maintain mostly the status quo. I mean, no rules change here and there to keep things to keep things on the rails, I guess is the best way to put it. They don't want to make any drastic changes. A lot of people like Carmen Reinhardt and others, they benefit from the status quo. People here in, Was in the Washington DC metro area that are grossly overpaid at a bunch of different jobs for the military industrial complex and the federal government, they like the status quo. And <laughs> I don't like the status quo at all. David, I think the system with, with these debt-based fiat currencies and the amount of credit, it's a Ponzi scheme because the total amount of debt, it just can't be paid back. So, and yet more credit, more currency, it just keeps getting issued. That we're, we're on the hamster wheel. How do you how do you get off? How do you how do you do something different at this point? The, the consequences of making a, a significant change um, come with pretty significant consequences. So, is there political will for that to change? No. Every, everybody wants to keep the status quo at least until they retire, um, so they can't be blamed, so that their legacy is not sullied or soiled. I. I, I how do we how do we see this um resolving um i don't know i mean we not nobody knows the future nobody has a crystal ball um but i think this is where you know thinking a little bit outside of the box makes some sense um do, do you need something in the equities markets today yeah prices can still get crazy crazy can get crazier just about and this is one of the things that nolan always says in our in our weekly meetings just about the time you think things have gotten as crazy as they possibly can they double from there and, and, and that's, that's true. And this is, this is why our work, uh, particularly his work, one of our products uh, is Tactical Short. Um, it's, a, it's a tough product, but I think it's the best out there. Why? Because he's still managing risk. Because crazy gets to crazier and you have to be engaged daily. He is. Every other short product out there, um, they're just flirting with, they're flirting with financial suicide because it's, it's not a, it's not a managed program. They have no idea how to manage upside beta. And you can see this in the last even few months. Um, they're getting destroyed, destroyed. Uh, Doug's doing an amazing job, an amazing job. Do you need something in the stock market? Yes. Do you need something in cash? Yes. Do you need something in, in real estate? Yes. Do you need something in, in gold and silver? Yes. Um, and you better be taking care of the rest of yourself. And it, this is, 
I, I don't know. I, I, I've never thought of the intentional legacy as self-help, um, but I know that's the way you described the, the book in the introduction. Um, to me, it's, it's a, you know, so many times we focus on managing resources and we think about our wealth in terms of the dollars and cents that we have. And yet so much of the wealth we have is about relationships. So much of the wealth we have is about um, social connection. So much of the wealth that we have is about things that have nothing to do with a very limited and you know, narrow, uh, narrowly defined balance sheet. Expand your view of a balance sheet and see that you need to manage your health. I, we've worked, we've been in the metals business for 50 years. My parents started the business in 1972. We helped legalize gold. Uh, my dad and a couple of other guys uh, worked with um, Sagamark and, and Jesse Helms office to, to change the legislation coming into 75. Um, you know, so what, what, I, what I see is people don't manage the stuff that really matters, the intangibles. Um, and so maybe in that aspect, it, it is kind of a self-help, just a reminder that, you know, if you lost all your money um, and you still had your health, great. And I guess what I was going to say is, is that going back to 72, we've talked to a lot of people who've made hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars. And you know what? A lot of them had compromised health and they'd have given it all to have their health back. They'd have given it all to have relationships back. You ever meet a really wealthy man who was a successful father? <laughs> very few, very, very few, which suggests that we are good at focusing in slaying monsters in one area, but not in, in others. I, I think as we look at the times ahead, you've got to be savvy in the way that you manage your wealth, but also just as savvy, if not more, in the way that you manage all of your other resources. Keep your body healthy. Keep your mind and mental space healthy. Continue to grow and develop relationships because when push comes to shove, go through a scenario where you've lost everything, you're bankrupt, or it's been stolen from you. The government has taken it all. What do you have then? What do you have then? Or looters, or looters or rioters took it all. They, the police didn't show up and the store was burned down. Yeah, so in, in that instance, you're talking about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You're talking about what is internal in terms of the resources that you've cultivated. Uh, what is external in terms of the relationships that you've maintained? I think that's just absolutely critical. I mean, so in the end, how many ounces of gold do you have? How many shares do you have? How many acres do you have? How many square feet do you have? That's great, but it's, it's just a big game. It's a big game. In, in the end, the things that matter are your, your intangibles, and you can lose all the stuff in the big game and still have an, an amazing, beautiful, significant life with your, your your intangibles if you've if you're dealing with that sort of expanded balance sheet definition of an expanded balance sheet so i i do think it's important i like the intentional legacy i think it's it's worth people reframing some of their priorities and and realizing it's never too late it's never too late to pay attention to the kids that need your attention uh a spouse that frankly because you've focused more on wealth generation than investing in that relationship may have good reason to leave you. <laughs> I mean, it, just think about it. Think about it. We care so much about money and security that we don't put enough effort into the other things that really make life beautiful uh, and meaningful. Um, dollars will never love you back. A house will never lo love you back. A kilo bar, I love, but it'll never love me back. So I, that's, I guess that's the deal is, is because we're dealing with some really interesting, intriguing, challenging times ahead, balance your portfolio by all means, but also balance your, 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 your investment of time and effort into some other areas because you don't know how you come out of this, uh, but you might want to know who you're coming out of it with. If I could summarize what you said in the last couple of minutes, Nassim Taleb wrote an entire book about it. It's about being anti-fragile. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and a part of that anti-fragile or, or anti-fragility, um, to say that differently, is is to account for the things that allow you to flourish. Um, and it might be as, as, as something as simple as, as five minutes uh, going on a walk in the morning. Uh, could be sitting down and having a cup of coffee every Saturday with a friend 
It could be, you know, once a week date night. What, what allows you to fortify yourself? Yeah. And, and so I get it. You, you, when you say self-help, I, I, I kind of understand where you're coming from, but I would, I would, I would lean towards the anti-fragile explanation and say, how do you strengthen who you are? How do you create more margin? You, you, you want extra liquidity coming into this from a financial standpoint. You want extra cushion and margin in your finances and you want extra cushion and margin in every area of your life as well. Um, and you know it. You, you know that if you have adequate cushion, you can work through just about anything. But it's when you go negative balance, whether it's the, the relational bankruptcy uh, or the company bankruptcy where you ran out of resources and didn't have enough in reserve, that's when you're in real trouble. So looking and saying, how do I invest accordingly so that there's adequate reserve, so that there's less fragility? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now you're, now you're on a track towards, um, I think, greater human flourishing. Yeah, I brought up self-help for your book because of the the trials and tribulations, the rough childhood you had. So even though your father was a successful entrepreneur, you know, you had to overcome different problems because your dad was so busy building the business. And, you know, I don't want to go into all the details of the book. Our listeners can get it. But you had a, you had a rough childhood. You had to learn your lessons. And now you're a successful adult. Yeah, and, and certainly, I mean, rough only if you're living in that moment um, relative to other people. I had a great childhood, very easy. Um, but, you know, is there relational dysfunction in our family? Yeah. Have we had to deal with it? Yeah. Is it an ongoing work uh, to, to keep relationships healthy? And do we find new things all the time? Yeah. And, and so that's where, you know, commitment um, – and the idea of, of, of things that are broken getting fixed, things that are bent getting straightened, uh, things that are wounded getting healed, I, that's our relational commitment. We're, we're not going to quit on each other. And, and that, that resolve is a part of our anti-fragility because we know that in spite of how difficult things get, even in a relational context, um, we're committed. We're, we're, not, we're not throwing in the towel. So... Um, yeah, it was rough. People will read the story and say, ah, oh, I wasn't that bad. You, let me tell you my story. And I, I respect that. I respect that. Um, I think we, we need relational commitment. Um, and that, that's one of the big things I, I, I figured out, I have figured out in my adult life. Um, looking, looking back, I'm glad my parents gave us that leadership role. They're coming up on their 50th anniversary. I'm super excited. Um, it's amazing. I can't, I can't believe as I look at how different they are as individuals um, and the struggles and challenges they've faced, as everyone does, man, my hat's off to them. This is their 50th anniversary. Super excited for them. Comes back to that idea of through thick and thin, um, do we have enough in terms of reserves uh, to get through it? So switching to different topics for the last couple of minutes of the interview, I want to get your thought on premiums and shortages for gold and silver. So was there actually shortages for gold and silver in late February and March and part of April? And are premiums going to start coming back down soon? Yeah. So the shortages are in the products that are most popular on the street. So for instance, if I'm buying a 400 ounce good delivery bar, no shortage there. Uh, if I'm buying a kilo bar, there's a little bit more of a, of, a, of a strain on supplies. When you get down to one ounce coins or fractional, part of the issue was, you know, if you look at the Royal, Royal, uh, the Royal Canadian Mint, if you look at um, any of your mints that have to produce um, COVID shut them down. There was nothing happening, right? So you, not only do you have mine closures, but then you've got the fabricators who are also, uh, because of COVID, uh, not operating. So there was a shortage on that stuff. You could argue that there's never been a shortage of gold because all the gold that's ever existed in the history of the world is available. It's just available at some price. So what you're talking about is price discovery. What is it going to take to bring gold that is in someone's hands back to market? And so what I think is interesting to consider is that there was a temporary shortage in supply, but not a huge willingness on the part of investors to let go of their gold at higher prices with higher premiums. It's like, no, I, I, looking at the fundamentals, I'm comfortable holding it. 
And so how high do those premiums have to go to start loosening up the supplies of existing product already out there? We didn't get there. We didn't get there. Um, so I'd say, I'd say it's a little bit of a short-term arbitrary type thing. Uh, we do expect more of it. Um, not necessarily because of COVID or a shutdown, but it's on the demand side, we would see that pick up. This is one of the reasons why I started a Swiss company back in 2008, 2009. We still use their services somewhat, um, but sold it to our partners in 2010 uh, over there um, because I wanted to open up supply lines from uh, Argor Horaeus, from PAMP, from uh, Velcambi, from a lot of the European suppliers uh, and not just deal with North American suppliers because we did. We had a, a limitation of, of, of supply based on demand. There wasn't enough supply to go around in 2008 and 2009. We've had just a taste of that this year in March. And I think there's more of it to come. And it may not be the arbitrary supply shortage. I think it's going to be overwhelming demand as people, again, start to look and say, hmm, my, my financial picture is not anti-fragile. It's incredibly leveraged. It's incredibly exposed. I'm losing money. What should I do to, 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 to sort of counterbalance risk, both currency risk and, and, and portfolio risk, volatility risk? And I, I think we're going to see huge demand for gold over the next three to five years on that basis. So get used to significantly higher prices and significantly higher premiums um, one of the things that I really like about our vaulted program is that you can buy $10 worth of gold and you're buying the economy of scale in a kilo bar format. So you can, you can put in any dollar quantity that you want and use it as a savings account, but you're not being penalized because you're coming into the smallest product possible, a gram bar, a 10 gram bar, a 20 gram bar, 50 gram bar. All of those things are very small and very high priced. We've given you access to any dollar value coming in, you're, you're getting the economy of scale on the larger format bars. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that just means that during that whole period of premiums, if somebody wanted to put in 10 grand into gold, if you're taking physical delivery of, 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 of Canadian maple leafs, you're going to pay through the nose because the premiums are up. But you can take a position in the ounces in, in vaulted. And then as the supplies change and, and you can get maple leafs again and you're not paying premiums, you can transition from the bars to coins. So, so it's a great tool for being able to position in the metals with, without having to pay through the nose. And maybe you decide you want it there permanently. Maybe you decide you want to take physical delivery of it, you know, six months out in the format that you originally preferred, but was unavailable. I think it's great. I, I love Vaulted as a tool. Vaulted.com um, is, is, is the, uh, if, if your listeners are interested, it's, um, where they can go to, to learn more about it. Yeah. And I think they can set up an app on their phone and they can buy gold that way too. So it's fairly easy. We've, we've done it. We've done it not as an app because I, I frankly don't like how often you have to update the apps and the investment that you have to put into the re-upping of that. So it's a, it's a, it's a web-based platform. Uh, you, it does have a mobile format so you can have it on your phone and download it and have it on your phone as if it were an app. But if you go looking for it in the app store, you won't find it. So just oh. vault, vaulted.com vaulted is the best, the best way to find it. Now the gold to silver ratio, it got as high as a little above 124 in March. And now it's come down to a little under 199.49. Do you think that's going to favor silver now going forward? Yeah. Um, what a crazy opportunity to, to be able to own silver at a ratio that's never been seen in, in, in the history of the world. Um, chalk that up to a 2020 opportunity. Um, talked to a client today who just about nailed that figure in a, in a Roth IRA converting from gold to silver and is already ahead by uh, you know 20% in terms of ounces if he wanted to convert back. And what a great place to do that. We've been doing that kind of a thing. We were one of the early adopters of precious metals IRAs back in the mid 80s when that was first allowed. And um, if anyone's interested, that, that's, that's uh, something, a service that we can help with and trading the ratio, particularly inside of an IRA, IRA where you get the full benefit, don't have tax consequences, is, is absolutely brilliant. So 
where are we at now? 99, you're right. And, and, and where does it usually trade? In a precious metals bull market, you'll see it oscillate between 40 and 60 pretty regularly. Um, so the distance between basically 100 to 1 and 40 to 1, which is not an extreme number, it's been as low as 15 uh, during the Hunt Brother days. And it's 100 year and 200 year average or 31.4. Sitting at 100 to 1, I, I think this is an opportunity to double or triple your gold ounces. And again, if, if we can help you do that in an IRA, maximize every dollar, I think that's an amazing way to increase your financial footprint. Brilliant way. So you mean eventually switch from silver to gold? So you mean accumulate, if you're going to play the ratio, you, uh, this is hypothetical, you mean not investment advice, you mean accumulate physical silver now, and then when the ratio starts to contract, then sell uh, trade silver for gold? That's what you're talking about? That's exactly right. And we've been doing that work for clients uh, and we watch the ratio and, and, and advise them as to when to do that. And we've been doing that for, uh, you know, since the 80s inside the IRAs and even before that outside of IRAs. So what you're doing is you're compounding your ounces. You're compounding your ounces. And so to start with a thousand ounces of silver today, theoretically, 30 years from now, I've been able to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, probably three or four times. And so you're doubling and then you're doubling on the double in ounces and then doubling again, you, you can see some pretty radical increases in terms of expanding your financial footprint. The number of ounces that you control by going back and forth uh, between between the metals. Uh, again, it's it's not that complicated. We, if you go to our website, uh, McIlvaneyICA.com, I think there's actually a, a piece of literature that kind of describes our compounding ounces, or you can get in touch with with our office and and find out more about quote unquote compounding ounces. Um, but the gold silver ratio is, is one way of doing that. There's actually a couple of other ways to do that. Um, probably don't have time to talk about it today, but um, that's, a, that's a very powerful tool. If you're gonna have precious metals, you might as well maximize your exposure during the duration of the hold. Maybe it's a permanent part of your portfolio, great. Um, this is a way where you can create a legacy asset, teach your kids and grandkids or allow us to, um, how to continue to maximize value from one generation to the next, expanding out that time frame and your ability to double the ounces and then double what was doubled and then double again what had been doubled twice before. So that kind of thing expanded through multiple generations is very legacy transformative. And you're not getting taxed, right? So like at a normal bullion dealer, if you go to sell your gold or silver, you're getting taxed a lot. So it's set up so to be tax friendly, right? Of course, inside the IRA construct. And if it's outside of the IRA construct, it, you can still do it and it's a, a huge benefit. Um, but, you know, you, you, you get to support your good uncle as well. And he's very grateful for it. So <laughs> some of the gains with him. But inside the IRA, of course, that's the opportunity uh, of a lifetime because you get to keep 100% of the gains while it's under that uh, tax deferred umbrella. Excellent. Well, David, I want to thank you so much for your time today. If my listeners want to check out the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary or take a look at the Vaulted app or take a look at the other McIlvaney Group of Companies, McIlvaney Financial or the Doug Nolan Tactical Short, how do they do so? You know, you've listed a bunch of different things and they all kind of have their own separate universe. Uh, the Vaulted app is, is or the Vaulted program is vaulted.com, V-A-U-L-T-E-D, vaulted.com. Um, the, the weekly commentary, easiest place to find it, skip our name, just type in weeklycommentary.com. So McIlvaney Weekly Commentary is there as well, but weeklycommentary.com will get you there. And our precious metals business is um, McIlvaney ICA. Again, I don't know why we have so many websites. It seems silly to me, but it, they're all different offerings. The, the tactical short doesn't really belong anywhere else. So the wealth management site is, is different as well. I already said this, working with the kinds of people that I'm working with today on the wealth management team is absolutely encouraging and inspiring. They're, they're, it's an amazing team. And to be heading into the kinds of market environments that we're in and, and, and going to be experiencing over the next three to five to seven years, I wouldn't want to be surrounded with, I mean, this is like knowing ahead of time who you're going into the foxhole with and being like, yep, this is the team. Absolutely. Everything we talked about today on a fundamental basis, the, the, the unhealthy aspects of what are what, what were transpiring in the financial markets, I know who I'm already in the foxhole with. And it's, it's, it's inspiring. They encourage me every day. Check it out. Hard Asset Insights is a, is a weekly 
uh, one pager that we put out on Fridays. It's at M Wealth M. So that's McIlvaney Wealth Management, mwealthm.com. Uh, that would be a great place uh, if you're looking for a one pager. And of course, Doug Nolan also posts the credit bubble bulletin on that same website. Just look for CBB, you'll find it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Anytime, Jason. Thank you.